Okay, good afternoon, folks. I'm actually going to start off with the autumn statement when I move on to this slide. Um, I walked into the room today and um, everybody was on their phones looking for the information in this autumn statement, and my heart sunk. Uh, Northern Ireland's been given £250 million for infrastructure. And I'm going, yeah, <laughs> that's not enough. And I wonder what type of infrastructure that they're actually planning on delivering this on delivering with this 250 million. More importantly, have we actually planned to spend this 250 million on infrastructure? So I'm going to try and bring it back to this research, this 250 million windfall that we've got this afternoon. So I have three parts to our, our presentation today. Um, first part is to look at a type of infrastructure. So the infrastructure I want to talk about today and look at today is social infrastructure, the softer side. I want to explain why I look at that and why that is very important in any economy, be it developed or developing. I'm then going to look at modes and means of financing that because that's one of the linkages here today, really, is that financing running through. So I'm going to look at how we can finance that against the backdrop of we just don't have enough to go around. We have a list of spending priorities, so how can I ring fence some money for social infrastructure. Um, and I want to identify some of these mechanisms that are available, these financing mechanisms that are available to finance this social infrastructure. And in essence, what we have done in this particular paper, but much broader research, uh, we have looked at another devolved economy, which is Scotland. And we've looked at this, well, how did you start to invest in social infrastructure? And then the third and final important part of this today is, well, what are the benefits of investing in social infrastructure? What are the issues here that I'm really trying to get to grips with? And if I was in government, what are some of these issues that I should take away here that could potentially inform policy? Or I hope more than potentially inform policy. So, three parts to it. Social infrastructure as opposed to the infrastructure that gets the headlines. Two, how we're actually going to finance this social infrastructure and the importance of that finance. And we're going to case study what Scotland's doing. And then third, um, some solution. Well, quite a few actually, solution-based recommendations. So, my first big thing, defining infrastructure. I think everybody in the room will go, yep, we know what it is. We understand what infrastructure is, and we know that it's important, and that's absolutely fine, and that's not what I'm here to do today. What I am here to do today is to talk about a different type of infrastructure called social. So essentially there are two classifications of infrastructure. We have the social infrastructure, and we have the economic infrastructure. <coughs> Combined and collectively, infrastructure encompasses both public and private assets, and it improves quality of service, quality of life, standard of living for those in that economy. When we break those two classifications down to economic infrastructure and social infrastructure, economic infrastructure, regardless <coughs> what that slide says, is roads in Northern Ireland. It's roads and the occasional bridge is economic infrastructure. And probably that's where the £250 million is going. And I'm saying probably because when I get into this policy paper or this presentation a wee bit further, I'm going to identify one of the weaknesses that we have in Northern Ireland in relation to social infrastructure, which makes me think that £250 million a day is going to go on tarmac. <coughs> now, I'm not saying that that's not important, but what I am saying, we are missing this one. We are missing social infrastructure of our economy. Social infrastructure is housing, education, health, recreation. And essentially, I'm going to prove to you today, based on evidence and research that we have collated over a number of years, that it alone can improve the quality of life and living standards for all here in Northern Ireland. So I'm kind of linking and hinting at the importance of social infrastructure. So now we've definitely got in our minds social infrastructure, housing, museums, education, hospitals. It is really important. Now against that backdrop, internationally there is recorded failure, not just by our government, but by governments internationally around both developed and developing governments that they fail to appreciate the potential and the benefits, i.e. the importance, the strategic importance of social infrastructure in growing and developing an economy. 
the United Kingdom, like Northern Ireland, are now at this really important stage where it is essential that we now make these investments in social infrastructure. But as we've all heard today, it's coming on the back of a period of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty around Brexit, Trump, and a lot of uncertainty in our corporation rates. That on the back of five, six, and seven years of um, a severe recession. So we have funding issues and we have a lot of funding uncertainties out there. But that aside is no reason to ignore and say, well, there's too many difficulties, too many uncertainties. Governments are starting to wake up to the importance of this social infrastructure and they are acutely aware that they have all of these dynamics in force and play. And that's okay. And that's why some of these policy seminars are really important whenever we have that heady mix going on. So social infrastructure can be very difficult to measure. It's going to be difficult for me here to say, and prove to you today, that it really will make a difference to the Northern Ireland economy. Now, having said that, this, this slide here, and I know it contains a lot of information, and it could have contained tenfold more information than what I've actually presented here this afternoon. But there's a few things here I want to pick out. I mentioned a few slides ago that social infrastructure will improve your quality of life. It will improve your economy. Essentially, this will make it a place where people will want to live, not just invest, but they will want to live here because of the social infrastructure provisions that this economy can provide. I did mention it is difficult to measure these tangible benefits that we get from the social side of infrastructure, but it hasn't stopped researchers trying and getting that tangible data and that evidence. I've listed some of that information here today. I could list more. I could make a much stronger case, but under the time that I have, I've picked out a few that are really important. So for example, if we focus there quite near the bottom on Casey, 2005, their research found that for every dollar invested in the community, in community infrastructure, aka our social infrastructure, $10 could be saved through reduced crime, better employment and opportunities. This is what I'm driving at. That's why we need a vibrant social infrastructure in our economy. Furthermore, um, social infrastructure in Australia has the total benefits attributable to public asset access in libraries, providing over or pretty much 31,000 jobs. So it's also a wealth creation driver. So it improves society, it improves our health, but also can contribute to the economy. Now, whenever you do get this paper, there's a lot more details to the policy paper itself. I think Michael said we'll get that, if not within a week, within a, a fortnight. You will have more information globally, internationally, making the case that social infrastructure has the potential and the benefits to improve society for everybody. And here today, I'm saying if we have a good society and a good economy, we are going to get people not just wanting to work here and invest here, but live here as well, which I think is going to make the difference, which I hope will make the difference. So to recap on that first wee section of the presentation. There are clear economic and social benefits to social infrastructure investment here and internationally. However, we have good issues. There are problems. There are those uncertainties that I talked about. And I'm hoping to identify some solutions to those uncertainties this afternoon. So against this backdrop of historical underinvestment, not just because of the recession, not just because of the reduction in the block grant, but also a lack of appreciation as to the role and the importance of social infrastructure. I talked earlier about the £250 million. Pound. It will be spent in roads because I'm pretty confident there will be no pipeline for social infrastructure provision because there's relative, um, relatively uh, little importance attached to the benefits of social infrastructure. And I'm also going to provide you with some information on what the executive believe is a pipeline for social infrastructure um, measured against society's demands. So the second part of our policy briefing and my presentation this afternoon is to do the comparative analysis. So a while ago there I had mentioned that we wanted to showcase, we wanted to look at another region. We were thinking about Manchester, we were thinking about Wales. Uh, the UK probably too big in its own right. So we thought, well, look, we'll look at Scotland. 
Um, not because it was novel. We know what's going on in Scotland. We thought, you know, that might be the best way to provide um, policy makers with really good data, to provide them with a really good comparison on a way forward. So this section is going to look at what Northern Ireland believes they are investing in social infrastructure and how they are investing, so these models, these finance models of social infrastructure investment. I'm then going to do exactly the same with Scotland. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Scotland's infrastructure investment, i.e. their pipeline, their projects. And I'm also going to talk to you very particularly about their models, so how they're going to finance and invest social infrastructure. And probably more importantly too, they are financing social infrastructure slightly different from we are, which we're not really actually financing much at all. But the benefits, these much broader benefits that they are delivering because of this investment. And then to finish off, I'm going to look at the UK generally. What are they now saying about investing in social infrastructure? What models are they suggesting we should be looking at moving forward? So here at home, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room is familiar with the Strategic Investment Board. Strategic Investment Board established uh, way back 2003 and they were brought in, as the name suggests, to act as strategic advisors. Essentially, their remit is to help government plan infrastructure and deliver major projects and to manage assets. So whenever we were looking at this paper and formulating this policy, we said, right, let's go to these strategic advisors. What are they signposting? What are they telling us they are going to spend on social infrastructure and the models of social infrastructure? Now, the Strategic Investment Board produces, uh, again, and hopefully you're all aware, the ISNI plan. Um, the 10-year document, the investment strategy for Northern Ireland. And in that investment strategy, they don't identify these pillars of infrastructure that I identified a few slides ago, economic and social. They identify these different pillars, such as skills and health and, and justice, and we'll talk about that. They call those pillars of society. So from those pillars of society, Strategic Investment Board then identify their strategic suspend spending plans or indicative spending priorities. So under these pillars, this is what we should be spending our money on. They also do recognise in their latest round of their ISNI programme for government that we need an efficient infrastructure. So we, there is a winning argument there. You need to have a really good, strong infrastructure, both economic and social, to deliver a vibrant, healthy economy and a grown economy and signaling to those outside it, here, come live here, come work here. But they recognise, as we all do in this room today, that there is less money to go around. Now that's kind of where it stops. So they understand the importance of infrastructure to a society. They understand the importance of prioritising and planning this infrastructure. But when it comes to actually funding that infrastructure, there is just a recognition that there is less money to go around. Now, on the back of that, um, the Strategic Investment Board do produce quite a lot of data on their infrastructure spending plans or their major capital works programme. And the bottom percentages highlight the importance that the Strategic Investment Board have prioritised, have given to infrastructure, particularly social infrastructure, 59, 63, 61. So roughly 60% of their spending priorities they believe should be um, delivered in those social infrastructure sectors. So when we digested some of that information and read it, we thought, gosh, this is great. They're actually prioritising social infrastructure. And then we started to drill down into these pillars, these different types of social infrastructure that are being planned in Northern Ireland. So the first one was skills, known more globally as schools and education, but in Northern Ireland, it's a skills pillar for us. They identified um, 18 projects, so there is a pipeline for schools, 18 projects, so that's great. But when you drill down to that, there's actually only really two major capital works projects. I actually would consider only one of them presently to be a major capital works project, the Struel Campus, £100 million 
That, to me, is a major capital works project. The rest of those 16, 17 projects, particularly the 16 projects there, are ranging roughly from 1 million to, to 20 million, the majority of those at the lower end of that band. They are not major infrastructure projects, but that is where 60% of our social infrastructure spending is going. These one, two million pound extensions, refurbishment, that is not investment in social infrastructure. Two other pillars then fall under the guise of social infrastructure. The first one here, health. One. One. We have one project pipelined in Northern Ireland. 37 million. One. That's it. That doesn't say to me that we're open for business. Two. Social. This is our housing. This would also take in um, municipal um, galleries, uh, theatres, um, museums, etc. They identified 36 projects. I'm thinking, this is good, 36 projects. But again, whenever you drill down into the detail there, there are only two projects that I would consider, that industry would consider, as major capital or infrastructure projects. One of those is um, £260 million, pound, but it's the renewal of boilers and heating within homes. It's actually no new build project. We're not actually delivering new houses, new schools, new areas. Um, new galleries, new museums. We are maintaining. And that's where our 60% of our spending allocation is going. It's going on the backlog and it's going on the maintenance. It's not going in direct investment. Now, the second part to this presentation wasn't just providing information on what we're spending in social infrastructure in Northern Ireland. It was how we're spending it, how we're funding it. The Strategic Investment Board, which does provide this very clear pipeline for us, um, and I'm arguing it is a clear pipeline, but it's not signaling investment, is, um, is very aware and very conscious in all their documentation that there is an issue with money. There just isn't simply enough to ground to use their terminology. But they are also aware that infrastructure is critical. And they are very aware of the literature that is growing and mounting in relation to social infrastructure and the significance and the importance, and the two must go hand in hand. But they don't provide us with a roadmap. They don't provide us with um, a solution, if you like, or an idea or recommendation that doesn't go much beyond. We must seek an alternative finance solution of capital expenditure. Essentially, this must attract inward investment into public-private partnerships. Now, that was a very welcome statement. There's no doubt about it. That's kind of opening that can of worms there. We can't do it on our own. We can't publicly fund social infrastructure. We need to look at other ways. And they've started to introduce this notion of public-private partnership. I'm not sure of what your knowledge level is within the room, but probably everybody knows what public Part, public private, I can almost say it. Do I know what it is? <laughs> public private partnerships. It does exactly what it suggests. The public sector work in partnership with the private sector to deliver a public service or a public asset. This usually involves the building, construction, design, planning, finance, and maintenance of that built asset. So, for example, um, a hospital, there would be a payback over a 25, 30 year period. It's not that the private company comes in and hires and fires the doctors. It's the asset that we're talking about. Very similar uh, analogy would be in oh, economic infrastructure where you pay a toll crossing the bridge. So in social infrastructure, these provisions exist. And I'm going to explain about some of these provisions that exist very specifically within the Scottish Devolved Assembly. Strategic Investment Board was a wonderful idea, still is a wonderful idea. They do great work. And Scotland, how do we look at how our, our uh, government was strategically advised? And they liked the workings and they liked the idea of the Strategic Investment Board. So they developed their own version of that called the Scottish Future Trust, or collectively the hub. And they are very similar in their uh, relationship with government and their strategic advisory role within government, particularly in relation to making these big finance decisions that's going to impact on the economy. Now, the strategic investment, or the Scottish Future Trust, 
the equivalent in Scotland, has a much larger, larger operational budget than what we do here in Northern Ireland, and that's fine, and that's not an issue. But, for example, in their housing, they planned or they have pipelined for... Um, well, let me see. For their housing, they have planned um, in their next five years to spend on housing alone, which we don't have, we have that within a different pillar, we don't have a separate housing as a signpost. And they, they plan to spend on education. Both of these spends are about two thirds of what, or Northern Ireland spends roughly about two thirds to what Scotland's spend is. And that's not the issue. They are a slightly bigger company, um, or slightly bigger country, I should say, and therefore we would appreciate and anticipate that their spend would be slightly more than what it would be in Northern Ireland. But again, whenever you drill down into how they're spending it, how they're identifying these spend, and how they're financing this spend, it differs significantly. So unlike the pipeline in Northern Ireland, the Scottish um, Futures Trust, or the hub, refuse to identify any projects that are less than £20 million they recognise that anything under £20 million really isn't a major capital project. Anything under that is a maintenance. It is a backlog. You're not investing in. You are maintaining. So they have identified that as a difference. So that's one key area that we should be looking at in Northern Ireland, identifying significant investment and not maintenance spend in a pipeline. They then have gone further again and identified models, means, ways of actually attracting investment. So point one is they have a pipeline. But point two is this pipeline is investment. It is significant. They then went down the route from about 2013, 2014 to investigate different models of financing this social infrastructure. There are lots and I'm identifying four for you today under the confines of the 20-minute presentation come the five, six-minute policy slide or paper. The first one is the non-profit distributing model. Absolutely fantastic. It really does work terrifically well at all levels. It superseded the... Um, older form of PPP, the one that's in the press, the one that's got the bad name, and to be honest, in some circumstances, rightly so, there were issues associated with it. That was originally called the Private Finance Initiative, about 20 years old, doesn't exist probably from 2012, 2013, for lots of reasons. We are done with that. We do not have PFI anymore as a model of social investment or economic investment in infrastructure. It doesn't exist. We do not have it as an option. We have moved away from that. So government was able to look, the Scottish government was able to look at the issues and the complexities of PFI and say, well, you know, in some cases it worked incredibly well and in other cases there were two severe issues. So let's learn from that. And they did. And this is where they've derived their non-profit distribution model of um, private and public financing. This model of funding has managed to reduce time and cost in the procurement process. I'll give you a time scale there. You're talking about two years roughly under the old PFI scheme from you had an idea of delivering a hospital to actually getting somebody in the room that could sign a contract that might start work next month on this hospital. That's two years. Well, things change too much. They've changed so much today, even for this presentation um, after the autumn statement. But that does, that's far too long. That's far too cumbersome, and we need the hospital now. We don't need to be talking about it for two solid years. Part of that reason for that two-year negotiation or delay in a standard PFI was the complexity of the contract. So they brought this contract in, and they have simplified this contract. It makes it easier, risks are easier identified, but more importantly, it gets this project off the ground a lot quicker. So in 2015, this model delivered 464 million of capital projects. If I compare that with just one project, one £37 million project that we had last year under health, there's no comparison. Two, TIF, again, quite a good wee model. Um, a lot of um, local councils and, uh, around the country are starting to look at this particular model. TIF is the tax incremental financing model that um, Scotland have developed 
and are rolling out throughout their territories. It doesn't seek private investment, rather it uses the delivery of the public sector through public sector, through locally generated public sector revenues, i.e. tax, or tax non-domestic rates or a form of tax. And they use that, they use the rates from that area to demonstrate um, and to deliver investment. Now this investment must contribute to economic growth. I will take your rates, I will use that as private sector money and I will use it to grow and invest in this area. So this is something that particularly Belfast, Derry, Oma, Straban should be looking at. And it's not just about creating growth and it's not about creating wealth, particularly for these cities, it's about regenerating the area. They have established tangible benefits from introducing this TIF model, which has delivered to date, 1.3 billion of private sector investment. It's working, and it's working incredibly well. You're paying your rates, you know where your money's going, and it's invested in your doorstep. Two additional models that um, I was able to fit into this presentation and into this paper. The first one is the National Housing Trust, and then the second one is the Growth Accelerator. National Housing Trust, as the name suggests, just focus on social sector housing. A really simple, straightforward model where you bring the private sector in, they will finance, they will design, they will construct, they will maintain, and they recruit payment back from tenant rates. You're delivering a far better quality product. There is innovation. There's productivity that we're talking about. There's happiness in the community because we are getting these houses delivered in areas where they're needed. There is a severe shortage of housing, full stop, internationally, even outside of Northern Ireland. Not only has this delivered 1,600 homes, it has also supported, and I'm thinking my own industry, over 2,000 jobs in the construction industry and the wider economy. That is a model our social um, housing sector and our housing executive could adopt, or Belfast City Council, if they go down the, the route of regeneration with social housing. And the final is the Growth Accelerator. This is one of their latest models, but already there has been benefits delivered from using this particular model of financing that isn't relying on the public purse. Growth Accelerator is a programme. It's also a finance model. Um, and it looks at city centre initiatives, and it looks at an area plan for a city centre, what's going to make this a vibrant city centre, what's going to make it work, and get the private sector buy-in to build, deliver, and finance some of these assets to um, deliver a very vibrant and, um, I think, open for business city. Collectively, according to the Scottish Future Trust, these investment programmes have unlocked almost £6 billion of additional investment in Scotland. So, at a very simple level, they've got their social infrastructure, they've got their houses, they've got their hospitals, they've got their schools. They've got them now. They're not waiting two years of negotiation, they've simplified the process, they've simplified the contract. Secondly, they are realising the benefits that these models can deliver. These Benefits cannot be delivered through private sector only investment. They must be a public private sector initiative where there is regeneration at the heart, where there is city initiatives. And then when you work in tandem the two sectors, then these benefits should be delivered. I think what's also very telling outside of the numbers, the facts, the figures, the millions, the, the hundred million pounds that we've looked at and the billions of pounds of investment and spend, just two figures out of the entire presentation, if this is the only thing you take away. Last year, Scotland delivered 88 of these type PPP projects. In total, we have delivered um, 39 in the past 15 years. They delivered 88 last year. We've delivered 39 in the past 15 years. There is an issue there. Now, what's the UK doing? What's the UK saying? It's too broad a picture for me to be very, very specific about what the UK is doing in these different regions and these different economies, and I can't compare like with like. What I can provide today is they get very clearly the importance of infrastructure, both economic and social infrastructure, as key drivers in an economy. They understand that. And in this slide here, I've evidenced some of the documents where they've provided that information very, very clearly. Secondly, 
they recognise it is the foundation on which the economy is built. So they understand the importance of it and they also understand the difference between the social and the economic infrastructure drivers. They also understand the importance of a pipeline about being realistic and they get that. It's not just about planning for the future, it's letting the private sector know out there we are planning on delivering X billion pounds worth of social infrastructure investment. Do you want to join us? So they're signaling to these private sector investors that we're open for business, that we'd like to do business, and that we have models in place to deliver. They have done this through a number of different documents, um, which are updated a lot, um, are updated usually um, every year, but more often than not, um, being increasingly updated with various different um, changes in the economy and the wider economy. So the National Infrastructure Commission has determined that 80% of infrastructure spend is going to be privately funded. That's not going to change. They need private sector finance, but they need the private sector involved in delivering the benefits of social infrastructure. The long-term strategy of infrastructure planning and spending must be at the heart of any policy that is being delivered. So it must have a long-term view, a long-term plan, long-term spending plan, and you must signal this to the private sector. And in their case, they have identified, as I said, 80% of all private sector um, infrastructure, 80% of all public sector infrastructure will be private sector delivered. I'm actually at my last slide. As you can tell, I'm a bit passionate about the subject. So, advice for policy makers, decision makers, people that are very important in this room and beyond. Um, social infrastructure is really important. We can't ignore it anymore. There are real dangers in ignoring it, and there are huge benefits for everybody, everybody in society, for investing in social infrastructure. To invest in social infrastructure, you must identify long-term priority needs. To do this is best done in conjunction with the private sector and engage with the private sector, not just solely for their finance. That's joint up thinking. You also need to identify a very clear pipeline. We anticipate that we're going to spend X million, X billion under various different um, categories of infrastructure spend and make it clear to anybody seeking to live, to work or to invest here that we are open for business. Thank you very much. That was my presentation. Thank you.